Hello, my name is Courtney Harris, the chairperson for the Department of Dance and Choreography. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the faculty lecture series with my colleague, Dr. Kate Sicchio. Kate is a unique faculty at VCU Arts in that she holds a hybrid position within the departments of kinetic imaging and dance. As a media artist and choreographer, she has brought our two departments closer together by reinvigorating our curriculum through new course offerings such as live coding, motion capture, wearable technologies, and new for this upcoming spring semester, dance in Hollywood and performance in social media. In particular, I have been impressed with the student work coming from her screen dance course as students are demonstrating a heightened level of uh, technical and conceptual prowess. I must also note that Kate has fostered collaboration between our departments and across the School of the Arts through art pro artist programming, as well as the new Rough Cut screening, which features films by VCU students from many disciplines. So I'm gonna take some time to read Kate's bio. Kate Sicchio is a choreographer, media artist, and performer whose work explores the interface between choreography and technology with wearable technology, live coding, and video systems to create work for galleries, the stage, and more unconventional sites in the forms of videos, installations, and performances. At VCU Arts, she teaches in a hybrid role as both an assistant professor of dance and media technologies and an assistant professor of kinetic imaging. Her work has been shown internationally in many countries, including Germany, Australia, Belgium, Sweden, and the UK at venues such as PS122 New York City, Banff New Media Institute in Canada, VNA in London and Artisan Gallery in uh, Hong Kong. She has been written about in The Guardian, Dazed Digital, El Diarios, and more recently, The New York Times. She's also co uh, jointly edited the book in Integrating Art and Technology in Practice, Techna, Technique, Technology with Dr. Camille Baker. Joining Kate today are student collaborators, Taylor Collimore from the Department of Kinetic Imaging and Tamara Denson from Dance. Without further delay, I'd like to welcome Kate. Hello, I'm Kate Sicchio. Um, I'm here today to talk about algorithmic choreography. Um, within my own research, I do a lot of different things. My PhD focused on real-time video projection within live dance performance. I do a lot of work with wearable technologies, so putting sensors and actuators, different haptic feedback on dancers' bodies. I've used machine learning to choreograph um, dance pieces. I've worked with motion capture. I've worked with screen dance and installation. And all of this kind of comes under this umbrella of dance and technology. But specifically within this dance and technology umbrella today, I'm gonna to talk about algorithmic choreography and how that has informed my current practice and my current project, Tripsicode. So when we break down algorithmic choreography, a lot of people think this is like sort of a new practice, but when we think about it, it might not be so much. If we think of algorithms, there's a lot of big, scary definitions of algorithms right now in the world, but I like to use a much simpler definition of algorithm, which is um, it's sets of rules. Computers only work when we give them sets of rules, right? But actually, when we think about choreography, choreography is also sets of rules, right? You have a certain amount of dancers in a certain space, right? So there's a rule. I'm going to have five dancers in this space. And then three of them are on the side of the stage doing a certain movement with their head, and the other two are on the other side of the stage doing that movement, but with their knees, right? So I'm giving all these different rules to produce a dance. 
So there's actually a lot of similarities in this idea of algorithmic thinking and choreographic thinking. I think, though, in general, when we think of algorithmic choreography, we do think of dances that have been generated by a computer, right? And there's a lot of reasons to start to use computers within your choreographic practice. There's this idea of randomization. So computers are really good at randomizing information. There's this idea of breaking habits. Computers might actually show you different options that you weren't thinking about as an artist or choreographer. And um, it also lets you um, create these bigger systems, right? So as we said, choreography is sets of rules, but maybe there's a way of making these rules that have different um, options or tools involved. Um, so this idea of using computers to make dance um, sounds like it might be a new thing, and that's because computers are now much more ubiquitous, but it's not. The first article about dance and computers was published in Dance Magazine in 1966 by Christopher Knowles. And then we have our first dance work that was actually choreographed by a computer done in 1964 by Jean Beanman. So she made a piece called Random Dances. It um, involved three lists of movement ideas that she um, um, had the computer sort of pick options from these three lists and give her a new combination. So she was using the computer as a tool to randomize her movement possibilities. Um, this picture is actually um, from another work of hers, um, but the idea is there where like there's a mainframe computer, right, and then a bunch of dancers. Her first piece, um, the random dance pieces, was made on an IBM 770, which is a giant mainframe computer. Um, I think the computer itself is from like 1958, and um, it weighs like 10.5 tons or something. So this idea that early computers made dances. This is not a new idea. Another sort of pioneer in this field is Ana Liva Cordero, who's a Brazilian artist. Her work is actually much more well known in video art circles um, than in the dance world. Um, this is a still from a video dance piece she did, um, M3X3. And her process of using um, computers to generate choreography was very complex. And this piece is from 1973. So she created algorithms that would both determine the movement of the body, the bodies in relation to each other, and the bodies in relation to a camera framing them. So this piece was made for as a screen dance piece, but also had all these other steps in order to get there that were completely uh, facilitated by computer input. To do sort of the movement part, she created a whole notation system using stick figures. And the stick figures then would um, sort of, you would get these different combinations of stick figures. The dancers would follow along as a score, almost like a music score, right? But a performance score for the choreography. Um, this is really key, I think, in understanding some of the things I do in my work. Um, she actually says, within this score, the dancer is free to describe the trajectory connecting the positions. And this is a key idea, I think, within this idea of using computers to generate choreography. It's not the computer telling the dancer what to do. It's this idea of like setting a sort of map, setting these keyframes, and then the dancer still has all this agency in between these moments. And that's actually the more interesting part of the choreography, is these in-between moments um, that the computer doesn't choreograph, that the computer doesn't give you. Um, since then, many other choreographers have also used computers within their process. Um, probably the most famous is Merce Cunningham, who's up at the top here. He used a software called Lifeforms, um, later known as Danceforms, for many years, um, almost up until his death. The very end, he didn't use it. Um, his first piece with a computer was in 1991 called Trackers. So he used this software to manipulate sort of these 3D figures and then would make the dance that way. He would then give this, these um, sort of animations to the dancers to learn and to figure out on their bodies. 
Another choreographer who's used a lot of different technologies within his process is Wayne McGregor. Um, this is a photo of one of his more recent works on the bottom. Um, he's created a recent piece with Google called Living Archive. So in Living Archive, he used an AI where he fed it thousands of hours of his dancers moving. And then they created a system where a dancer is tracked in real time with a camera. And based on what, they're, what movement they're doing, the computer gives them options of different um, movements to try after. Sort of along those lines is also um, work by a French choreographer, Miriam Gorfink, who also made a notation system for dance. And then her dancers wear sensors. And as they're performing, the, um, it's looking at flexion, I believe, in the joints. And based on that, those flexions, the computer gives the dancers more options to try in terms of movement, all um, based on her notation. So um, Cunningham said this about using a computer, particularly using life forms, but I think it goes for all these compositional, uh, computational systems, and that life forms is not revolutionizing dance, but expanding it. Because you see movement in a way that has always been there, but isn't visible to the naked eye. So Cunningham said this in, a, um, in an interview with Tekla Schiffhorst, who was an uh, important figure in the dance tech world to mention. She sort of brought life forms to MERS to use in the early 90s. But this idea that it's not about replacing a human in a process, it's actually just bringing in new tools in the process. And there's lots of metaphors for this. Maybe it's a tool, maybe it's an instrument. Um, I'll talk, we'll see more of those um, as this goes along. But it's never replacing the dancer or replacing the human or replacing the agency, right? It's always just um, something that might shed new light on the dance. So, where do I fit into this sort of lineage? I actually do a slightly different process in terms of algorithmic choreography. I do a process called live coding. So live coding is really a programming practice that's performative. It happens in real time. So instead of writing code and then waiting for the computer to compile it and then seeing what you have, you're actually writing code as the system's running so you get an immediate feedback cycle with the computer. So this happens in a lot of different performances, usually music and visuals. I'm also in a band that does live coding where um, myself and another woman make music and then our third mem member makes visuals. But this also can be applied to this uh, field of algorithmic choreography. You can use the computer to live code and to make um, a dance work happen. In live coding, we have some sort of rules. I use that loosely. Um, there's a draft manifesto. The idea being you can go back and edit it, right? Just like you're going back and editing your code as it's um, happening. Some of the things that happen in the, in the draft manifesto talk about actually showing your screens, right? So showing your code is part of that practice. Um, it doesn't have to be, but that's normally the case. Um, and that's something I've adopted um, into my work as well. I usually show the code that's actually making the piece. And I'm also interested in this idea of the code being the score for the dancer. So there's something written usually, not always, um, sometimes something visual, but that is actually what the dancer is following along with. So to show you an example, um, some of my, um, this is an early, one of my live coding pieces called Hacking Choreography. Um, so I started uh, um, working on this piece in 2011. The video we're gonna see is from 2014. But the idea here is that um, as the dancer is following this score, I'm going back in and changing it on them. So I'll show you what that looks like. Right. 
So in this piece, we start with um, two dancers, and then I'm obviously on the stage as well, typing away. <laughs> um, and I really wanted to see, OK, can code actually make a dance? Can these things be comparable? So you can see I'm identifying the two dancers, giving them a place to go in the space. And then I start to define some movement, right? So each dancer is going to have different terms um, and different gestures to associate with these sort of variables that I'm creating. So once we've defined the movement, then we can actually start to loop it. So this is live coding, though. So it's much more fun when we actually change the movement on the dancers rather than just give them a simple loop. So you can see I changed the three to a two, and I'm going through and changing things on them. So the dancers are reading a score and moving, but also knowing the score is changing on them and trying to respond to that. So then we make it more complex, just to make it more difficult and fun. And then to add another layer, I start adding conditional statements. So the dancers have to now relate to each other while they're moving. So they're looking at the other dancer, trying to read, trying to interpret, trying to move all at the same time. So a nice little moment of cognitive overload. And we keep adding to this as the piece goes on, right? So now we've added some qualities that were defined um, right before this moment, and so on and so on. So they're, they're constantly having to add and change and pay attention to what's happening um, in the performance. I think another important thing to mention with this piece is that the code itself is actually a pseudocode, meaning that um, the computer actually can't read this and run it like it would JavaScript or something like that. This is a code that's only made for humans to read. And what's really nice about that is like even if the computer can't read it, the dancers can always read this. And what became interesting in this particular performance of that is that this came in very handy that humans will read and interpret a pseudocode because towards the end of the piece there starts to be typos. I'm going to try to find it. There it goes. So at one point it says quality instead of quality. So if this was a computer, it would just stop running, right? It would be like there's an error. But because they're humans, they just keep going and keep, and keep running with it, even though it's, it's a mistake. They're running the code that doesn't work anymore. What was really interesting about that moment was like many people in the audience thought that was intentional and that um, it was this like big reveal of like the difference between humans and computers and how we interpret instructions, but it wasn't intentional at all. It was just something that happened in that piece, in that moment. So this idea of making these scores live and changing them um, as the piece is happening in real time using computers has kind of been the theme in a lot of my work over the last few years. Here's a few more of my pieces um, that involve live coding. Um, these are all various collaborations. So um, this large photo of me performing is a collaboration with Alex McLean in a piece called Sound Choreographer Body Code in which we were, um, uh, Alex was live coding sound on stage while I was following this really complex um, computer generated score that was based on spanning trees. And we created a system that actually would feed back into each other. So my movement was being tracked by a camera that would affect Alex's code. Alex's code was making sound. My computer was listening to the sound and analyzing it and that would change this um, score I was following. So we made this feedback loop. Um, another piece I did was with Nick Rothwell um, and dancer Tara Baker um, up in the top corner. So after the first hacking choreography, 
I was interested in make, seeing the difference of what it would be like if we made a score that was actually um, the computer could read, not just the dancer. So we made this piece in closure. We moved the projection from the back to the floor, which I think is a little hard to see in this photo. Um, and then we also structured the way the words came up um, in the score as if it was um, a piece of closure code. So in closure, you have like a function that's like broadly telling you something to do, and then you usually have parameters. So there would be like a movement, like jump, and then there would be like parameters like gently or like knees. So how do you jump gently with your knees would be the, the job of the dancer to figure that out in real time. And then this bottom image, again, is um, Tara. And this is a piece called Vibe Shirt. So uh, this piece is actually really sort of important in my understanding of like why live coding with a dancer. Um, in this piece, there's a shirt with two vibrating motors, one on each sleeve. And I'm live coding those vibrators in the shirt, right? So I'm either telling the right arm to buzz, the left arm to buzz, both to buzz, how quickly it will buzz. And then Tara's job is to take those um, sensations and turn them into movement. Um, what became really interesting in this piece is that I would send all these things and think I knew what Tara would interpret it as. And then she'd go off and do something completely different. And then she would like find this moment of something that she liked and would keep going with that and keep doing it. And that was like really important for me to understanding like, oh, I'm not telling her what to do. The computer's not telling her what to do. Like she has agency in this moment and this is duet, right? And this is actually more of a jam. And like that became a really like fantastic moment in the work is that we could feed off of each other I could give her something and she could go and explore that. And then based on that, I could change um, what was happening in the code. And it really became this moment of give and take rather than this like structure of dancer following instructions from a computer. Another important uh, piece that I wanna talk about is called moving patterns. So this piece is from more recently, I think 2018, and that I had started working with images a lot, particularly with machine learning algorithms. I was using um, like thousands of images and feeding them through an algorithm called a T-SNE. And I got really interested in how patterns emerge in these images. And I wanted to find a way to live code images. So I worked with a programmer named Tom Murphy who helped me create this sort of little library for an already existing live coding language called Title Cycles. In Title Cycles, you are working with sound and you make patterns of sound in these tight loops. And it makes all these interesting rhythms and polyrhythms and all sorts. So I was like, oh, let's try that with images. And so we did this small piece um, with, uh, this is an alum from VCU Dance, um, Marissa Forbes. And it was really um, exciting in terms of like making these loops and like it really started to see this idea of like, oh, here's all these shapes and the dancer can connect all these shapes, similar to the work I was talking about earlier. But what was missing was actually on the language side. And for me, it was, I was using this title cycles language, which is made for sound to create a dance. And I was like, oh, I wanna use dance vocabulary. I don't wanna tell the computer like, these sound things. I wanna to talk to it like I'm talking to a dancer in the studio. So that became the sort of inspiration for Tripsicode. So I'm calling this Tripsicode version 1.0 and then today I'm gonna to demo very hot off the presses Tripsicode version 2.0. But I really wanted to find a way to create a programming language for choreography. That became the aim of this project. I wanted to be able to sit at the computer, type words that I knew as a choreographer, and get these loops of movement that then a dancer could interpret. And I wanted to be able to do it in real time. I wanted to be able to make it a performance piece. So it's a live coding language for patterning images 
that a dancer can interpret as a visual score in performance. <laughs> so I made this language in probably an unconventional approach. I don't think, I actually don't know how to make a computer programming language in general, so I sort of found my way through it as an artist. And the first thing I did was actually sit down and sort of think about all the words that I might want to use in a programming language. And sort of like categories started to emerge. There's like movement terms, there's terms about timing, there's terms about actual order and composition. So my first step was I actually just like put a million stickies on the, my office wall talking about the language, the words, what actually do I want to tell the computer? From there, I needed the images. So um, I've been using this process um, in many ways um, to actually collect sort of like lots and lots of images of a dancer um, within a setting using a time-lapse camera and then sort of organizing them with machine learning. So this is an example of um, the first um, time we did this for Tripsicode with Marissa. But then we needed to like find a way to like get these images and this language um, to talk to each other. So we actually had to tag all the images with these movement terms. So in version uh, 1.0, we actually printed out the TSNI from the machine learning put it on my wall and started like drawing the clusters of movement and then naming them. This is like a very like analog approach to this problem. Like it would probably be easier to do it some way on the um, computer, but this felt actually like a really satisfying choreographic thing. Marissa and I did this together. We'd like find a cluster, we'd come up with a name, like we were working together, like as if we were in the studio, like carving out movement we did that together on this um, giant map of what we had for movement. And then our first version was actually coded by a KI alum, Z Wang, who helped with this um, sort of getting all this movement into a parser with a JavaScript sort of backend and actually being able to call up the images that we had tagged by using these terminologies. So using the word duck using the word crawl, right? All these things we wanted to say about this movement, we were now able to tell the computer. And then we were able to make these loops of images. So TRIPS code 2.0 is what you're gonna see today. You can see a little demo. We did a similar process with the images. So this is Taylor and Tamara, who you're gonna see dance in a moment. Um, also, thousands of images of them put into a TSNI. In terms of this time, we didn't um, go in and draw on our printouts. They are printed out and they are in the wall in my office. But we didn't get to like do that same clustering um, process. Um, but I let them pick the images that they wanted to use instead and to sort of tag them. Because we already had like some movement terms now from the previous version, so they could use, start to use that. Um, they also picked images based on ones they thought were clear. They picked ones that they thought would inspire them. And they tagged their images that way. So going through, picking out things that were of interest to them, and then they did all the tagging themselves. So they really had a hand in how they organized this, this data. And then the main um, difference in this version of Tripsicode is that we have lots of more terms for controlling timing, for controlling composition. Things that we would like try in the studio can now try in the language. So things like um, you can like say, we'll use sometimes lunge to the computer and we'll 25% of the time um, in a loop run an image of a lunge. Right? So it's adding this like probability, it's adding this option, it's adding randomness right, in this system that if you did in a studio, you, might, you can tell a dancer to like sometimes add a lunge into what they're doing, right? but it might start to get habitual um, and might start to um, look the same. And this is a way to shake that up. I think also some of the like 
words like accumulation is like very much like a, a dance compositional practice. And so it was great to have words like that in there. Or also um, the coin flip, right? So this is another like ode to Merce Cunningham, who often used um, coin flips to determine things in his choreography. So why not make the computer um, also do a coin flip? So to show you what this actually looks like, I have Tamara and Taylor with me, and we're going to do a live demo for you. Thank you. 